Um, hey everyone, uh, I'm Gubsheep and I work with a research focused organization called Zero X Park. Today I will be talking about this idea of ZKPs and programmable cryptography, which is a phrase that we use to describe a lot of what we focus on at Zero X Park. Uh, I'll describe what programmable cryptography means and why we think it's important for anyone who is interested in the future of next generation uh, blockchain and decentralized applications. Um, so first off, I'll give a little bit of context into what Xerox Park is for folks who have not uh, heard about this organization. Um, Xerox Park is a relatively new research-focused org which supports what we call application-level R&D on Ethereum and other decentralized platforms. So this means um, trying to better understand what is possible to do on these kinds of uh, you know, smart contract platforms or with new decentralized application technologies uh, that isn't necessarily currently possible today but might be on the horizon. Um, projects that we support include uh, things like Dark Forest uh, as well as Persona Labs building things like Hayanon or if folks were around the uh, Applied ZK Showcase yesterday, you might have seen proof of email or various uh, ZK machine learning experiments. Um, we also uh, build circuit primitives for ZK snarks and focus a lot on infrastructure maintenance and third party development uh, of tool stacks like SnarkJS, Circom, Halo 2 and more. Um, and we also do a lot of community building efforts uh, and we work on cross team and ecosystem wide projects as well. Cool, so one of our largest areas of focus at Xerox Park is applied ZK cryptography, um, which means that uh, a big focus for us is understanding what is possible to do with ZK crypto, what you know, theoretically should be possible to do uh, with ZK crypto and decentralized apps, and what we need to do to, to get there, to eventually bring those kinds of tools to production. Um, and Applied ZK is one of a category of relatively newer cryptographic primitives that we categorize under this term programmable cryptography. Um, and uh, in order to describe or you know, give a feeling for why uh, programmable cryptography is important, first I want to go into a little bit about the, uh, a couple of the reasons that we think that Applied ZK is especially uh, important. So um, there's two concrete reasons that I think are especially compelling in terms of uh, why ZK is going to be powerful for unlocking the next generation of decentralized applications. Um, and uh, I'll just go through those real quick. So the first thing is that uh, zero knowledge cryptography gives us um, what I think of as an expressive language for claims. So what does that mean? Um, we'll go through an example to, to get a sense um, for what an expressive language for claims looks like. Let's take the example of um, ZK Snarks and group membership proofs in the context of claims about digital identity. So um, the uh, simplest kind of identity claim that we have from cryptography and something that we've known how to do for many decades is prove a statement like, I know a private key corresponding to um, someone, say, like Alice's public key, which implicitly identifies me as Alice. Um, so this is something that I can do with a digital signature, um, something like you know, RSA or ECDSA. Um, the invention of public key cryptography made uh, proofs like this possible, or made provable statements like this possible. Uh, and this is infrastructure that underlies um, so many of the digital systems that we uh, know and rely on today, including you know, secure traffic uh, on the internet, uh, as well as blockchain systems like Ethereum or Bitcoin. So <clears throat> going up one level in, uh, in complexity from the previous slide, uh, we have claims like, I know a private key corresponding to one of the public keys in a group. So for example, I know a private key corresponding to one of Alice, Bob, or Charlie's public keys. Um, this kind of claim is commonly referred to in the literature as a group signature or a ring signature. We do have cryptographic protocols that are purpose built to enable people to generate you know, group signatures or ring signatures, um, but they are, again, special purpose built for this kind of claim. And the math or like the cryptographic protocols that make these sorts of claims possible are oftentimes incompatible with uh, the math used for ordinary signature schemes. So, uh, you know, we figured out how to do these group signature schemes a few years after we figured out how to do s digital signatures in general. Um, 
However, it is the case that in order to make claims like these, or in order to build up a system or a network in which people can make these claims, um, you, have to build, uh, you have to bootstrap like an entirely new um, you know, key registry, you have to build a different uh, key generation algorithm, and you have to popularize that. So, you know, the math involved in making a claim like this can be, can be incompatible and require you to sort of move to an entirely different system than if you want to, uh, you know, uh, use systems that allow you to make claims like this. So one thing that I want to note is that today, um, however, we have uh, another much easier way of uh, enabling these kinds of claims, and uh, a manner in which, uh, a way which is, you know, actually compatible with systems for proving the first kind of claim. So um, with ZK Snarks, the problem of building a system that allows you to make these kinds of claims from a system that allows you to make these kinds of claims is actually a really simple, essentially two-line code change in a ZK circuit. So rather than having to invent an entirely new mathematical protocol or new key generation algorithm, if I have a primitive that allows me to prove in a ZK circuit that I possess a public key corresponding to some private secret, then what I can do is I can construct a ZK circuit that says, I know some public key corresponding to some secret private key. Um, I'm going to keep that public key secret. And uh, that public key minus hash 1 times public key minus hash 2 times that public key minus hash 3 equals 0. So if I can prove all of this in zero knowledge, what I'm effectively proving is that I know a private key corresponding to one of these three you know, public commitments, hash 1, hash 2, or hash 3. So um, this way, I now have this system which uses the exact same key generation uh, algorithm or key generation strategy as a system that allows me to you know, simply prove that I know the private key corresponding to Alice's public key. Um, and we've turned essentially this problem of building group signatures from a math problem where we have to go to a cryptographer, they have to write us a paper, do all this stuff, um, bootstrap a new key registry into essentially a programming task that um, you know, any developer familiar with, say, CIRCOM can carry out. Okay, so slightly more complicated than this, we can go a level even further up um, and consider augmentations to this protocol, uh, such as I know a private key corresponding to one of Alice Bobbert Charlie's public keys, and the other two either can or cannot prove that they did not generate this message. So sometimes this, is, this property is called by various different names. Um, some call it like disavowal. So uh, as an example, like suppose I'm Bob and I generate a signature that is uh, either coming from, uh, you know, you can see is coming from one of Alice, Bob, or Charlie. Um, Alice or Charlie might be able to generate a proof that uh, they did not create that signature. So, um, yeah, there's cryptographic systems that allow you to toggle this property on or off. Uh, but again, these use new math, are incompatible with previous systems, and are generally fairly difficult to engineer. Um, again, however, with ZK Snarks, this is a pretty trivial, like, two-line circuit code change. Um, so again, we're sort of seeing this idea of this language that allows us to build these expressive claims that are compatible with uh, you know, previous claims that other cryptographic systems will allow us to generate. And finally, we can get to claims you know, of this level of complexity, something like, I know a private key corresponding to one of Alice, Bob, or Charlie's public keys, um, and I either possess a signed attestation from one of David, Eve, or Fred, uh, one of these trusted you know, attestation service providers, or during a block with header X, I knew the private key corresponding to an account with at least 32 ETH, and you know, dot, 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 you can kind of compose a bunch of arbitrary uh, you know, predicates on this identity claim. And I think it's pretty fair to say that there's like no cryptographer in the world who you could go to um, and ask them to build a uh, special purpose new cryptographic tool that would allow you to prove this specific kind of claim, nor would it even make sense to. But again, <clears throat> with ZK-SNARKs, this actually becomes fairly trivial. Um, you have your building blocks in ZK circuits for each of these things, you know, uh, key pre-image, signature, recovery, um, proof of inclusion in the Ethereum Merkle Patricia try, uh, and then you can just put all these together, essentially calling all these like different functions in your ZK circuit code um, to start building out these claims. So another framing of this uh, idea of the expressive language for claims is that ZK snarks turn math problems into programming tasks. 
Um, rather than having to go to a cryptographer to write you a new paper every single time you want a new kind of digital identity claim um, to uh, exist in the world and be provable, uh, you can just have a ZK Circuit developer compose the right primitives inside ZK Circuit code. Okay, so cool thing number two, which is closely related to cool thing number one, is that ZK adds interoperability to cryptographic systems. So what does this mean? Well, <clears throat> to explain this first, I just want to do a quick breakdown between two terms, snark-friendly versus snark-compatible cryptographic primitives. Snark-friendly cryptographic primitives are um, you know, primitives like hashing algorithms or digital signature schemes or encryption algorithms that are specifically purpose-built for um, uh, to be efficiently provable inside of ZK Snark proving systems. So, for example, the MIMC or Poseidon hash functions or EDDSA uh, signatures. Um, these uh, cryptographic primitives uh, oftentimes have been invented in the last couple of years, and you know the hope is that with these primitives we can move towards a world where we can do more and more inside of Snarks. Um, however. Most of the cryptographic systems that exist in the world use cryptography that was invented before we knew about ZK snarks. Um, so for example, a lot of hash functions use a lot of bitwise operations, which are very costly to do inside of ZK snarks. Um, and so these, these systems are not snark friendly, but they are what we have to work with. So for example, all the signatures on uh, you know, emails signed by mail servers that are being sent out are not going to be snark friendly um, signatures. However, we can start to at least connect all of these different SNARK compatible systems together um, by embedding these different signature algorithms, hash functions, encryption schemes, et cetera, inside of SNARKs, even if it is costly. So as an example of a few crypto systems that exist out in the wild, um, we've got key distribution and identity registries, such as like, you know, you can build a, a, an identity registry of like GPG keys. Um, GitHub allows you to generate locally a key pair and upload it uh, and make it publicly accessible to anyone so that anyone can verify you know, your commit history or things like that, repos you've contributed to. So for example, if you go to github.com slash gubsheep.keys, you'll see like my RSA keys. Um, Ethereum and Bitcoin rely on the ECDSA signature scheme. Uh, so addresses are going to be you know, a hash of an ECDSA public key in Ethereum. Uh, and I think mail servers use the DKIM protocol to sign and authenticate messages, which under the hood uh, relies on RSA. So um, one of the things that's going on with all these different signature schemes is that um, they kind of can't really talk to each other. You know, if you're running on the RSA protocol, you can't really understand an ECDSA signature. Um, however, by making all of these primitives SNARK compatible by implementing RSA signature verification, ECDSA signature verification, et cetera, et cetera, inside of SNARKs, what we can start to do is we can start to build adapters between all these different systems. Um, so again, if I have an RSA primitive and an ECDSA primitive inside of a SNARK, then I can start to make claims like either I have a, a GitHub account that's contributed to the you know, Ethereum GitHub org, or I possess at least 100 ETH. Um, and again, by making existing cryptography uh, snark compatible and combining that with this expressive language for claims, we can start to make statements about all sorts of digital or online activity. So both of these features are examples of the power of programmable cryptography, which probably as you've grok grokked from now, um, you know, both of these features are giving us these tools to much more flexibly manipulate digital objects. So now I'm going to kind of give my description of programmable cryptography, which is that it is uh, cryptography that can be layered on top of arbitrary computations. To contrast this with uh, cryptography that we've been using for the last couple of decades, well, for more, most of cryptography's short history, the set of mechanisms that we've been able to instantiate with our tools has been you know, quite narrow. So we can say things like, this message originated with Alice, as we've seen, or this message can only be read by Bob. But every single new mechanism that we want to build, whether it's like you know, arbitrary identity predicates or read permissions or things like that, would require us to build a new special purpose cryptographic system. However, now we're seeing tools like you know, ZK Snarks, as we've discussed, that allow us to move from this message originated from Alice to I know a private key corresponding to one of these people, I have an attestation from one of these service providers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
to things like witness encryption. Uh, witness encryption is a primitive that essentially allows you to encrypt data, not with like a uh, key pair, where someone has to know a certain secret to decrypt the message, but it allows you to decrypt messages with, or sorry, encrypt messages with a program. So for example, uh, I can encrypt uh, a message with a Sudoku puzzle, and anyone who solves the Sudoku puzzle will be able to generate a key to decrypt the uh, message that I've encrypted. Uh, with witness encryption. Um, and this allows us to move from systems where we can do things like Charlie has published some secret vote that only a coordinator can read with the coordinator's private key, to Charlie has committed to some secret vote that only a testers with a certain permission level can decrypt today, but which a class of auditors with a lower permission level can at least partially decrypt in exactly you know, one week. Uh, I would say that smart contracts also spiritually uh, kind of fall in the same category as a lot of these other programmable cryptography primitives. So, um, you know, imagine very early on in the history of uh, this idea of blockchains, uh, we would have these consensus engines where people could come to consensus on only very simple or specific data transformations. Data transformations like, you know, Bob can decrement his balance by 100 Ether to increment Alice's balance by 100 Ether. Nowadays, with smart contracts and programmable blockchains, we can sort of execute arbitrary predicates. You know, at block B, 100 Ether will be available for withdrawal by Bob, so long as Bob has closed his position in some smart contract and no one's submitted a fraud challenge, though an early withdrawal may be initiated if two of the following three solvency conditions are met, et cetera, et cetera. So in each of these examples, there's this common thing, theme of moving from the specific to the general. With ZK snarks, I can move from proofs of specific claims to a general purpose language of claims. Um, smart contracts allow us to move from coming to consensus on canonical data that can be modified in only very specific or narrow ways to a general purpose language for modifying or executing code on this canonical data. Witness encryption moves us from a world where um, we can permission data to only be read by a specific person or a specific set of people to uh, having a language for specifying arbitrary predicates for read permissions. So I kind of imagine this as like, you know, decentralized OAuth tokens where anyone can uh, plug into this like global authentication system and specify who can read what and when. Um, and there's all these new <clears throat> primitives that are continually getting better and better, and more and more feasible, things like fully homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, even really far out things like in indistinguishability, obfuscation, uh, and more. Um, oh, and you know, I, there's a couple of folks who have sort of independently come up with this categorization or framework. I believe the Cersei team calls these computational crypto systems. Um, so you know, very similar in general spirit to what we're calling programmable cryptography. Okay, so um, the second part of this uh, basically thesis is that programmable cryptography uh, itself seems like a very powerful tool. Blockchains are also a very pow a powerful tool, but it's not sort of a priori obvious uh, like why these two things are related to each other, except that they both sort of derive from similar mathematical principles. But I claim that there's actually a very deep and complementary uh, marriage between these two powerful things. And to explain why I think that is, first I want to give my kind of mental image of what Ethereum as a data availability layer looks like say like five or 10 years out from now. So in my head, the way that I kind of conceptualize the idea of you know, Ethereum, the global data availability layer, is I think of Ethereum almost as this like, you know, giant, super thick coaxial cable um, that basically streams humanity's like global stream of consciousness. Um, so humanity's you know, promises, bets, secrets, debts, dreams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this coaxial cable is uh, you know, made available to any person or computing device in the world. So, um, you know, any phone, any computer that like lives on some, you know, like institutional server, anything like that, can hook into the one gigabyte per second canonical data stream, look up data, and know that they're seeing exactly the same thing as someone across the world is seeing. <clears throat> now, right now, this data stream is completely transparent. Um, and that has been a design decision that has been necessary in order to gain acceptance of this particular um, data stream that we're wanting to claim is the canonical data stream or the, the legitimate data stream. So in order to build acceptance, uh, we have this principle of don't trust, verify, and in order to verify, you need to be able to see all of the data. Um, but I claim that this is actually extremely limiting. Um, there is a wide class of applications 
that you might care about to build where you don't want every piece of data to be completely public. Um, and I think that when a lot of people talk about this idea of privacy or information asymmetry, you know, people have various different beliefs on uh, like various ideological nuances around privacy. But I, I want to go even a level lower to explain why I think this is important. Privacy is important not just as a matter of ideology, but simply as a matter of mechanics. There's certain coordination systems that just don't work unless you have information asymmetry. And in fact, most of the complex systems that we see in the world today and most of the organizations we have in the world rely on the idea that different people know different stuff and can do different stuff. So um, the way that I think about this is that what we would really like to do is we'd like to be able to enforce read, write, execute permissions on this canonical data stream that is uh, the blockchain. And the way that we do this is, you know, in fact, programmable cryptography. Programmable cryptography gives us these expressive tools and languages for enforcing read permissions, like we mentioned with things like witness encryption, uh, or write or execute permissions, uh, which we're seeing with things like, you know, ZK snarks uh, and smart contracts and more. So to give just a toy example of uh, why this kinds of permissioning or access control is really important, um, I want to consider the example of games. So, <clears throat> for example, let's, uh, let's consider poker. Uh, in poker, a lot of the depth of the game relies on the fact that I know my cards, but I don't know your cards, and you know your cards, but you don't know my cards. Poker as a game would simply not work if we knew each other's cards. It would be completely degenerate, right? Like, it wouldn't really make sense, it wouldn't be any fun. Um, and, uh, you know, a slightly more complex example of this might be uh, strategy games. So a couple of days ago, we had a talk on Dark Forest, which is a fully on-chain on strategy game. You can kind of imagine it as something like StarCraft on the blockchain. And one really key mechanic of Dark Forest is that in Dark Forest, um, players' respective locations are all hidden, which, gave, which gives the game a lot of its um, you know, relative strategic depth. So the general pattern here with games is that uh, oftentimes what we're going to do is we're going to have players commit to a state that they keep private, and whenever they want to make a state transition, they're going to provide a zero-knowledge proof that they are making a valid update on uh, their private state and committing you know, a valid state commitment to the network. So this proof might prove something like, um, I'm moving my you know, secret night from secret location A to secret location B. I'm not going to tell you what A or B are, but this zero-knowledge proof proves that you know, there's an L shape between them. Um, or zero-knowledge proof might prove something like, I'm drawing some card, I'm drawing it validly according to the rules, I'm drawing it out of a randomly shuffled deck, uh, I'm not cheating and just like, continually drawing a bunch of aces. So, you know, there's a bunch of uh, game examples which we can kind of imagine where the game just simply does not work if all of the information is transparent. And while those are kind of toy examples, I think they allow us to start to hint at this more complex future where we're using blockchains for um, a much wider range of use cases. So, you know, I think one completely digital, uh, completely reasonable digital interaction we might expect to see something like in the future is, you know, imagine like I walk into a store and perform a cryptographic handshake with the merchant and perform like a multi-party computation with some identity provider. Um, after verifying the merchant's identity, I give uh, the merchant one token that permissions them to access some specific data uh, on my preferences for an hour, and another token that allows them to transfer a limited amount from my balance. After that transaction completes, I update my transaction history that's private to me and committed on-chain, uh, but only visible to myself. So, you know, each of the components of this interaction today are not possible um, due to the fact that there's so many things, uh, there's so many constraints on what we can keep private. But again, with things like fully homomorphic encryption, witness encryption, ZK snarks, et cetera, et cetera, these kinds of interactions may start to be unlocked uh, while still preserving the neutrality uh, where all of this data is living on some like, globally verifiable blockchain or data availability system. So um, the last kind of like, analogy that I want to make here uh, to kind of create an image of what this future might look like is, you know, I want to kind of uh, describe the concept of an ender chest from the game Minecraft. So uh, Minecraft is a 
uh, you know, sandbox game in which you can harvest resources and build stuff. Uh, and in Minecraft, there's this concept of chests. So with a wooden chest, um, if I build a wooden chest, I can like place it down here. I can put items in, uh, into the chest. If I leave and come back, the items are still going to be there. Um, the chest is a very important like primitive in Minecraft. If anyone else goes to the chest and they open it, they're going to be able to see all the items that I've placed in there. Um, in Minecraft, there's also a very powerful uh, tool called the Ender Chest, which is sort of similar to a chest, but has these kind of, this kind of magical property, where Ender Chest's inventories are marked as like per player inventories and are sort of shared across every Ender Chest that exists in the world. So if I put an Ender Chest down here and put down like, you know, five stone or something, and then I put an ender chest down over there, and like I walk over there and open it, I'm going to see that same five stone. Um, and if someone else walks, into the, uh, walks over to the ender chest, they're not going to see that same inventory that I have. They're only going to see um, you know, what they've put into the ender chest. The ender chest is an incredibly powerful tool for Minecraft players that allows them to execute on these larger scale strategies, build these much more complex constructions. It just makes it easier for you to do a lot of things. And I think as more of our social and economic activities move online, we're going to need primitives like these, these digital ender chests that allow us to carry things like our reputation, our financial history, our social context across different platforms. And in order to do that, we're going to need these new privacy-preserving mechanisms uh, that fall under this category of programmable cryptography. So that's all I've got for today. Um, if you're interested in any of the work that we're currently working on around programmable cryptography or anything else, you can check us out at zeroxpark.org, or you can find us on Twitter at, at zeroxpark. But thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, as we went through a lot of the slides, there were examples of ZK things where you have a claim, and it's true or false, and you prove it. But I guess the bigger picture of all programmable cryptography could have other sorts of statements like, I summed all these numbers, and this is the true sum. And so I guess those are other flavors. Maybe that's homeomorphic encryption. I'm not sure. How friendly are those with each other right now, like proving things and doing math and getting continuous results? Yeah, uh, this is a great question. So um, right now, you know, as you've probably noticed, like, we are specifically very focused on zero-knowledge cryptography, which is you know, one of one piece of this like, much broader category, but it seems like disproportionately represented. Um, so why is that the case? Well, uh, one reason is that zero-knowledge crypto systems are simply much more mature today than a lot of these other systems where there's, there only exist theoretical constructions or academic implementations. Um, we expect things like witness encryption, for example, to be much further out, and we're still even trying to like, describe the landscape of what is possible to do with multi-party computation. Um, so, Unfortunately, none of these systems are super compatible because a lot of them don't yet like, exist in a form where you can meaningfully start playing around with them. Uh, but we hope that that is going to be evolving rapidly over the next, say, like, you know, couple of years. Hello. Thank you very much by the, your talk. Have you made any kind of research around uh, quantum cryptography, ZK? Yeah. So um, I think quantum cryptography is a slightly like, orthogonal direction to uh, what a lot of these tools um, are going to enable. Uh, specifically, for example, like one way that we think about the interaction of quantum cryptography with these tools is considering which of these tools quantum, or like which, you know, for example, ZK algorithms uh, or like FHE algorithms we have are quantum resistant. In other words, once we have quantum computers, uh, which of these algorithms might we be able to break? Now, that's kind of a different thing, however, from necessarily um, you know, the affordances of these tools. Uh, so for example, like, um, you know, it's, w when I think about programmable cryptography, I usually think about it from the perspective of like, what these things can do for us, rather than necessarily like, what's the underlying uh, algorithms and what are the computational models in which they might you know, broken by or enabled by, whether that's quantum or elliptic curves or, you know, large prime fields or things like that. Uh, thank you for the talk. Can I ask you if I understand you correctly, the state currently in Dark Forest, uh, you keep it locally and uh, you just put the proofs on chain. Um, that may not be ideal for the future. Um, if you lose the state, you kind of uh, lose the game. Uh, like, w uh, what are your thoughts on how to keep the state safe um, in, in other ways, either using a homomorphic encryption or your general thoughts around it. 
Yeah, this is a great question, and I think, like, you know, as an extension of the debate that people have around the viability of, uh, you know, everyone custodying their own keys, for example, on a blockchain, um, I think that there are uh, a couple of things here that might be possible. One is, like you mentioned, fully homomorphic encryption might allow us to store private state on, uh, that is encrypted on, you know, cloud services, uh, but still be able to, like, retrieve that data and perform operations on it just like we would if it was local uh, while still preserving the privacy of that data. That's pretty far out though, and in the meantime, I think the most immediate thing that we can focus on doing is like building more user-friendly solutions that allow you to keep critical or sensitive data on your own machine. Um, I mean, everybody already does keep critical and sensitive data, uh, so it's a question of like, as the volume of that data or as the sensitivity of that data grows, then how can we make those systems even more and more ergonomic and more and more secure? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, what do you think about the fundamental bottleneck of like ZKPs um, being quite slow, and you have this trade-off between like proof generation and verification? Do you think we will have sort of more like <coughs> external off-ramp solutions, maybe like layer twos for, for ZK, or like do you see the most promising solutions being in like fundamental ZKP research? Like, what do you think of that whole performance trade-off? Yeah, so personally, um, I think that there's still a ton of low-hanging fruit uh, in terms of performance optimization for these currently very expensive crypto systems. Um, for example, with ZK, uh, by some metrics over the last three years, the si or like over the last four years, the size of circuit or like the size of computation that you can ZK prove in browser efficiently uh, has you know, expanded by like three orders of magnitude. And we're still seeing like rapid improvements via new protocols, new better engineered libraries for proving stacks, uh, more efficient circuit implementations, and things like, you know, ZK friendly hardware uh, are just getting started. So I think that like, well, eventually uh, there may be some industry of services that arises around, you know, offloading computation or things like that. Uh, at the moment, there are still a lot of optimizations that have not yet been fully you know, explored um, that I think can enable some really, really complex proofs, uh, even on like small client devices like mobile phones. Is there any other questions? Cool. Thank you.